welcome back. I heard some fun adventures happening today, some long walks, and some of you have tired legs. Whew. I slept. <laughs> I feel great. <laughs> um, so tonight, we want to kind of take the next bit of the picture and unfold it. We've seen the table of the Trinity, the perfect love that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live in. We have seen the overflow of that love to creating us and inviting us to come and sit down at the table with him. We've spent some time looking at our posture and what we bring and how we converse with him. We're going to move tonight to looking at each other. Um, what does the relationship of the Trinity have to say about how we live together? So I'm going to invite you to close your eyes again. You're going to love me for this by the end of the weekend. But would you close your eyes? And I'm going to ask you some questions. Um, And just as you're sitting here, would you imagine the people that are closest to you, people that you would call your community, your Christian community, um, whether it be your church, your home, um, they may be scattered around the world, but just think of the people that you influence and that influence you and that you walk with regularly. <clears throat> so who do you see sitting around the table with you? in your mind's eye. Who is sitting beside you? Who are you facing toward and looking at? Who are you facing away from? Who do you share your deep joys with? And who do you feel comfortable to bring your sorrow to and your pain and confusion? Where's their conflict? Where's their comparison? Who is there that you just don't know how to interact with? They seem so different from you. Or they're just going through something you don't understand and you don't know how to be with them in. Take a moment and rest with God around the table with these people. And ask him, what, Lord, do you want to say to me about the people who are coming to my mind. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bring these relationships to you. We submit to you and we walk forward. Would you show us tonight what we need to see about you, about ourselves, and about those around us? In Jesus' name, amen. So these are the relationships we're going to talk about tonight. And tonight is... There's going to be quite a lot of experience, um, and we're going to spend some time really dwelling in a passive, passage of scripture. 
Um, but first, I want to talk to you for a bit. <laughs> so how do we enter into each other's experience with God? It's one thing to look at. I can look at Sally, but if I'm not looking at her with God, how, am I entering into her whole experience? How do we invite God to come with us as we meet with, meet with each other? Um, how do we move toward living together with our whole heart? We talked this morning about bringing our whole self to the table with God. How do we bring our whole self to the table with each other? For some, this feels actually a little bit more scary. How do we seek each other's healing, redemption, joy, reconciliation, and hope? How do we grow up in all things into Christ, who is our head? How do we walk the long road with each other? How do we bring all that we know of ourselves to all that we know of another? And invite Christ to dwell among us, to move us, to shape and sharpen us, and through us to bring redemption to all. If we are a body, we each have different gifts. We each have different temperaments. We each have different strengths. We each have different weaknesses. And somehow, Christ holds all of that together. <coughs> oh. I want to share with you a story of when I saw this working really well, beautifully. Um, one of the things that I have been was asked to do a number of years back for my organization was to create, with a team, a three-year series on listening to God. And I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. Don't know where to start. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's start by listening to God. So the core team and I, there were four of us, and what we did, we met every month via Skype because we were all in different places. And we stopped and we listened. We listened to God for each other, we listened to God for his heart for the women. We didn't actually start planning anything for about four months, because <laughs> we thought, oh. But in that process, we walked through each other's joy. We walked through some incredibly deep, hard places. We started a foundation. We didn't know each other before we started. We began a foundation of listening and of being with each other that carried through the entire three years. So we got to the first session, the first meeting, and we had kind of the four of us that had planned it, and then we had six other uh, leaders who were doing small group leading and different kinds of leading. So our first task was to listen. I said, guys, let's just stop and listen to what God has to say. So we asked the question, God, what do you want us to pray into? What are the strategic places? Where are the places that need, need prayer? Um, what's going on, basically, in this place? And what happened stunned me. Um, so we would listen for a few minutes, opened our eyes, and one woman said, I can see it. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so she saw something happening over here. She said, I see this over here. We need to pray into that. That's not my job. She passed it on to someone else. <laughs> who said, I can hear it. I hear this, this voice, I hear this conversation. And one by one, about half of the room went round and had a sense of what was happening. I, the leader, nothing. I'm sitting there going, oh, right. <laughs> thank you, Lord, you're showing them. What was actually going on in my heart was like, oh man, I'm not really fit to lead these guys, I can't actually hear God. And it split second, it was like God just came in and was like, that's not your job. I have brought you to bring this together, to, lead, to, lead, to, to pull it all together. Whew, I was so relieved. <laughs> um, but what I saw in that place was the body working together. I saw 10 women who had 10 different gifts who got one message from God. And we knew where to pray, we knew what to do, because women were willing to speak 
what he had given to them to bring. I just want to hold that picture before you because it was a picture of the body working well together. It was, a, it was a, just a moment, a glimpse in time. So each of us brings to our community a strength and a weakness. We bring a gift and we bring a growth edge. Sometimes we can uh, mistake a gifting for maturity. You know, I could have sat in that room and said, well, if I was really mature, then I would see or I would hear like, um, and that's what we often do. But God had given a specific reason for, for giving those different kinds of seeing and hearing and knowing. Um, but each of us brings that. As we walk the long road together, we learn to live in our identity. We learn to, to live the gifts he's given us and live who we are in Christ. We labor together to throw off all that's not true. And we begin to truly live as the body of Christ that has already been redeemed. Our growing up together involves bringing our whole selves to the table, bringing the gifting without fear, and bringing the growth edges, and meeting in the middle with Christ. So how do we become this community who loves both the strength and the vulnerability in each person, who speaks truth over the shame, the guilt, and the loneliness, and the lies that we all hear? that live within each of one of us? How do we become a community who daily reminds each other that we're part of a bigger story? Who goes to battle for each other rather than against each other? Who seeks the good of another over our own? A community where your whole self is free to come and be loved? Where truth is spoken and lies are broken? Where we walk through the dark nights and the bright mornings? We sit in the desert together, and we encourage each other up the mountaintops. That's the vision I give you of the community that I want to be part of. <laughs> but how do we get there? How do we offer presence? I want you to think about your deepest friendships and relationships. What has brought you to that place? What has brought you to a place where this person knows you and loves you, and you know them, and you love them? What have you been through together? What have you brought to the table that has built that friendship, that relationship? Um, th there's vulnerability, and there's a trust. Vulnerability, and there's a trust. And it's a cycle. As you share more vulnerably, there's more trust. As we share more vulnerability, there's more trust and then there's more vulnerability, and there's more trust. I just think about what Pam said today in her seminar about um, if you want someone to be more open, be more open. <laughs> um, but just how does that cycle grow? How do we bring ourselves? Um, and how do we bring our own gifting and strength and hold it loosely as we grow and as we walk together? How do we know when to speak and not to speak? How do we hold space for one another in, as God holds space for us? I want to go back to that myth of isolation again, the lie of isolation. Um, I just think about how many times I have been tempted to go back to that. Since in the, in the last five years, our family have been through some really isolating things, um, long-term illness, some really hard pregnancies, small, tiny children, um, you know, things that have caused me to be tempted to withdraw because I don't know how to step out and ask for what I need. What, what I realized I craved in these times, we had about four years where we were just hit. <laughs> but I thought, I don't actually know how to ask and how to receive. You know, when people offer to help, I'm like, yeah, come on over. And they come over, I'd be like, let me serve you tea, let me help you, you know, and it, you think. But what I craved in that time was relationship. I wanted someone to come and just be with me, and I didn't know how to ask. I didn't know how to say, can, can you just come be with me? <laughs> I'll serve you tea, just come be with me. Um, but people stepped in when I didn't know how to ask, and that was a gift. That was a gift of presence that they gave. And they just came and they were with me. And uh, yeah, sometimes I was not coherent. Sometimes I was. It was great. 
Um, but I want to just ask you, what is your isolation? What is the place where you don't know how to ask your community to come and be with you? You may not ever have even thought about it, so maybe just take a moment and think about it. What is the place where you feel isolated, where you are tempted to withdraw? I want to introduce you to a woman who you may know fairly well. Um, <clears throat> a woman who was actually physically isolated. Um, her story is found in a few different places, and I'm going to read to you from all of them tonight. But we're going to spend some time with her. I'm going to read you the quick version of her story first, just to tell you who we're talking about and give you a little background. So this is from Matthew 9, verse 18. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to her, herself, if I only just touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. The report of this went through all the district. So we're going to spend a little bit of time just sitting with, being present to the bleeding woman. This unnamed woman had been bleeding for 12 years. It's not a pretty story. There's no nice way to put it. The law in her day would mean she was unclean, and as a result, she was isolated and most likely was physically excluded from society. She was not allowed to touch her parents, her siblings, or her husband if she had one. She couldn't bear tr children, and quite possibly would have been relocated to the edges of the city to avoid accidental contact. We don't know what age she was, though she's thought to be potentially in her early 30s and we don't know who she loved before this ordeal began. So I'm going to read you the first half of the story again. I just want you to sit and think about, just not even think about, just enter in with her. What was that like? Um, When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt her body, in her body, that she was healed of her disease. Would
would you imagine with me as, as you're just sitting there with your eyes closed? I want to unfold her story a bit more. It was the usual custom for a woman to relocate during her monthly period, as was required by the Mosaic Law. As the week passed, she was still bleeding. Another week, and another week, and another. Something's not right. Mark tells us that she suffered much at the hands of doctors who were unable to heal her. What was that like? The first time she saw a doctor, and another, and another. What was her process? Did she think it would be resolved quickly? Did she expect that it could be explained away and there would be a remedy? What was it like after a year? Two years? Six? An endless cycle of washing, purifying, cleaning, anything that came into contact with her. What was contact with her family like? What was it like for her in year 12 when she heard that the great teacher was coming? What went through her mind as she pondered how to approach him? Did she hold hope? What was she thinking as she dressed that morning? She will have been incredibly weak, incredibly small. Knowing that she was about to break the rules of her isolation, she could potentially make, make people unclean by coming near them. She was not only going to press through the crowd, brushing up against, but she was going to touch the great teacher's garment. She had a plan. In her mind, she might have thought she would make him unclean. What might she have been feeling? Maybe a mix of fear, confidence, hope? This is my last chance. Can I relate to her in any way? So she comes, she touches him, she's healed, she sneaks away. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. And that moment that Jesus turned, who touched me? Had she hoped that she would be able to sneak away? Why didn't he let her sneak away? Why wouldn't he let her go unnoticed? Was he going to condemn her? Or was he maybe just going to go beyond what she could imagine and fully restore her? Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed of your suffering. This proclamation was so much more than a simple physical healing. This was Jesus restoring her body, soul, and spirit, and restoring her place in the community. This was Jesus announcing to the community, this woman is clean, you take her back. 
She was restored to every relationship and every right that she held within the community. When he tells her to go in peace, he is calling the whole community to embrace her. Just take a moment with that, with her. Close your eyes and just sit with that. And what was his invitation to Jairus, the synagogue ruler? Verses 34 and thir- 35 and 36. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. Let's just sit with Jairus for a moment. <laughs> Jairus, a synagogue ruler, used to getting what he wants, but fully aware that Jesus is greater than he. His daughter is ill on her deathbed. He remembers, ah, Jesus, who runs, finds the teacher. The teacher agrees to come with him. Firstly, running was not a dignified thing, so he was desperate. He was, he was humbling himself to ask Jesus for a miracle. He catches the teacher, who agrees to change his plan and come with him. And then the teacher stops. What's he doing? Come on, Jesus, hurry. But Jesus doesn't hurry. He starts combing the crowd. What is Jairus thinking? Um, Jesus sees a woman and begins to talk with her. Firstly, you're not meant to do that in public, um, much less when a synagogue ruler is waiting for a miracle. How does he respond? How does he respond when, in the midst of this interruption, he hears his daughter is dead? It's over. But the teacher says, do not fear, just believe. It's as though Jesus is reminding him that God is not bound by the limitations of man. There will always be enough. When one receives, the others don't lose. Just sit with that for a moment. Sit with Jairus. What was his invitation to the crowd pressing in? Take a moment, imagine yourself as one of them. You see this woman, unclean, pressing through the crowd. Maybe she brushes up against you, you freeze. What does this mean for you? What happens when Jesus pronounces her saved, healed, and delivered, fully restored to community? How do you celebrate with her? How do you open your arms and rejoice with her? Do you find that difficult or easy? As I read the passage again, this time from Luke, which invitation do you need to hear? I wanna invite you to see the story unfold through the eyes of that person. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. There came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? 
When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing, him, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. We know that Jesus went on to raise his daughter from the dead. Just sit with that picture for a moment. What comes to mind? What surfaces for you? In what ways do I struggle to meet brokenness? We don't have the strict physical separation anymore of clean and unclean. But oh, how we divide in our minds what is comfortable and what's not. What do I need to let go of in order to sit in the uncomfortable and the awkward places with others? That's a big question that probably we need to sit with for a while. you think about your body, soul, and spirit. Where is your place of waiting, of hoping, and longing? You just spend a moment opening your heart to God in that place. So there are big losses, grief and waiting that we can see obviously. But what of the things that are less obvious? What about the chronic waiting for marriage, for a child, for a child to come home to God? What about the spiritual waiting the one who's in the desert and has felt this dry, dusty ground for years and just needs a drink of water and everyone just tries to fix them? What about the one who's finding doubt around every corner, disillusionment, threatening to undo them, and they can't find a way to voice this? What about the one who perceives that everyone else is being blessed tended to, cared for, whilst I'm standing in the crowd waiting my turn. How do we sit in these places? How do we speak truth? And how do we sit and dwell together in Christ and allow him to come and be the restorer? I've had a few times in my life where I've had the chance to mutually walk through waiting with someone who's in a different season to me. Um, and it's been really stunning um, when two people who are having different struggles can come together around the longing. So at, at one point when I was single and not wanting to be, and walking with a friend who was 
wanting to have a baby and not able. And looking at the two of us walking together, we could have said, oh, you wouldn't understand. But what we did instead is we brought our desire, we brought our longing, we brought our waiting and the grief and all that came with it. And we were able to walk together through a very, very dark time for both of us. Um, but to see the light of Christ come into that place and transform because we were walking together. So I like to call this abiding with each other. So we abide in the vine, but all the branches are together in that vine. How do we abide with one another? I have some ideas. So I wanna just give you some mindset, really some things to remember as we are with each other. Um, So the first is to remember who sits at the table with you, that you are surrounded by the God of the universe who is perfect love. Look and listen with him. Imagine that he is your eyes and your ears and listen with one ear to the spirit, one ear to the, to the person. That's the first step. How do we invite God into those places? I often can hear someone struggling and I want to fix it. I want to, I get, I get panicked because I think, oh no, I need to fix this. But that's not my place, that's for God. Remember the person that you are with. What are they like when things are well? What do you know about how they speak to and listen to God? This is where walking together in the highs and the lows comes in because we need to, we need to be able to hold the truth for one another, to remember who we are. We don't define them by this particular moment and we need to let them come through it in the time they need. You think of the the bleeding woman, 12 years. How many people would have come and sat with her? How many people might have walked with her? And finally, embrace silence. Don't be afraid to just sit with someone. It is not your job to fix them or to have the answers. How do we just be together? I'll keep that up for a minute. Hang on, I'm missing a slide. I'm gonna tell you the next one. (laughs) To know your own junk. Um, It's really important that we are aware of what what triggers us. (laughs) What's me? Um, There's certain things that if, I know that if I hear them, that's probably about me, not about the person I'm with. It's not gonna probably be a word for them. Have I grieved my own loss as well? Have I allowed God into my places of grief, my places of longing, my places of hope? Because if I've allowed God into those places, then I'm gonna know where I connect, how I connect with another. Who may, their circumstances may look completely different, but we may see that there's, there's more connection than we realize. I see what I've done. So next we need to have a robust theology of suffering. And this is one that I'm gonna leave with you. (laughs) We're not getting into the whole story of it tonight. But God's will is to bring us into life abundant, which does not always look like instant healing. There are times when not healing physically will bring a person to greater wholeness and intimacy with Christ. And that is the good when he says, all things work together for the good of those who love God. He's saying, I want to bring you into relationship with me. All things work together for that good. Um, So your part in sitting with someone is to hold space. You can bring them to Jesus, but only he can heal them. So don't take responsibility for God's part. Um, I wanna show you a book that recently came to me, like in the last couple of weeks. I met this woman, Diane Comer, 
and she, sp she spoke at a conference I went to a few weeks ago. This book is called He Speaks in Silence, and this is her story of she went deaf when she was 26 years old, 26 to 28. She went from full hearing to none. She had small, four small children at home, I think, um, and this is her story of the journey that she went on when God said, I am not going to heal you, your ears. I'm going to heal you. And it's a powerful story. This was just given to me, put in my hands, and I read it and was like, aha, this is good. Um, so I would just recommend it if you're a reader. But it's, I think there are stories, there are plenty of stories where we just need to understand that God has, Pam was talking about it today, he has the sovereignty, he has the choice of what he's going to do, and he can see from the beginning to the end. He can see the plan he's working out. So our, our job is to sit together in it. Um, so Christ lives with us in our weakness, and he is so patient as he waits to transform us, to reframe our stories, He's not drawn in by our fear, our cynicism, or our false expectations. And he's not afraid of our weakness. He's not afraid of our emotion. He's not afraid of anything that we bring to him. So scripture is full of stories of brokenness and strength living together in a person. So we need to live honestly in our broken places. And we need to to offer that presence to another. Occasionally a word will find me. <laughs> it's like God just finds me with a word and then lives it, makes me live it out for a while. But the word that came to mind this year in the last few months is that word presence. And literally, he will just bring it to my mind and it focuses me. Look at this moment with me. Look at your children with me. Look at your church with me. And it's, it really is transforming the way I'm looking at things um, because the, the presence of God with me and with you together is transformative. And it, it brings us into alignment with him and it brings us into unity with each other. It is the thing that will, it will bring us to that, that ideal place I saw before, just, you know, that where we grow up in all things into him who is our head. If I can be present to God while I'm present to you, he will transform us. He will bring us to unity. So I heard a quote from Beth Allen Sleeveco recently, who just wrote a book called Broken Hallelujahs. I've not read it yet, but it sounds fantastic. <laughs> but it's how do we grieve the big and the small. She says, I cannot control what will happen to the things that are most precious to me. Jesus has already gone ahead of me and is present there. My part is to stay open to God in what is happening, both the joy and the pain. God's part is to come and be our comforter. We must not take responsibility for God's part. And I just love that picture of how, how do we walk it together? We stay open. We think about how you sat with the invitation to the bleeding woman, to Jairus, to the crowd. It's the same way we sit with the invitation to one another. Where's your place of waiting? Where is the person next to you's place of waiting? And how do you connect and allow Christ into that place? Where is your place of grief? Where is the person next to you's place of grief? And how do you invite Christ to come and meet you both in that place? It can be interesting to take a person that you actually find more difficult and look for the place where is your common ground. Where is their place of longing? Where is your place of longing? What are they saying? What are they feeling? Look at it through their eyes. What does life look like? Where have they been? What's their story? We need to hear each other's stories. We need to know each other. We need to see each other. Can you look around and see the people next to you? Until we all grow up together into Christ who is our head. 
Can we bring all of these things? And can we walk together? Can we sit together in the good, in the bad? Can we bring thanks? Can we bring our joy and bring our pain? And can we sit when one of us is feeling joyful and one of us is feeling pain? Can we sit together in that? Can we face the awkwardness of it and sit? I think that is the place where where Christ is most present or most obvious among us is when we can come together and really let him work between us. So I want to ask you just to close your eyes again and look around the table. The people you saw at the beginning that you've kind of been with. And I want you to ask God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who do you want me to see? In what ways do I need to invite my whole heart to turn toward the heart of another? What do I need to let go of in order to see my brothers and sisters more clearly? Is there someone with whom I need to make things right? Is there a hurt that I need to acknowledge to you, Lord? Is there a person I need to see through different lenses? What do you want to show me? Is there a gift that I have been jealous or suspicious of? Lord, show me what I need to see about my community. So I want to close with a thought. What if we actually believed the counterintuitive claim that Jesus insisted on upon all concrete evidence that you are completely safe? You are safe in the arms of God. We would give away money, things, time. I'd say our heart much less guardedly. We would make our decisions in a spirit of deep attention to the call of the moment, listening and moving with the invitation of the Spirit to act without second guessing. We would plan less. We would let things unfold. We would behave as children do who know that their parents' watchful eyes are on them in the freedom of knowing someone will catch them if they fall. May we rest in that place together tonight. I want to just give you a few moments just to capture what you want to take away and really just sit in that. I'm going to leave this quote up. Would you just sit in that? This is what we as a community are invited to. We are safe. We are secure in the arms of God. So just take a few minutes and would you guys play for a minute?
just pray for us. <clears throat> Father, I thank you that you are here. I thank you that you walk among us. Thank you that you have the power to open our eyes to see what's true and right and lovely and to speak that over each other. Would you teach us to see and teach us to walk with you and with one another? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Um, just a very quick word. I've been putting in the back, I'm sure most of you have noticed, but in the back of your notes is kind of a version of all of the practices that we're doing in each of the meetings. So if something is connecting with you, it's in the back of your notes.